Hey, this is the uh, re video review key for your unit one test on quadratic functions. Okay, so we're going to start off with problem number one. It's asking you to do a lot of stuff, so we'll just take it line by line. It's saying identify the vertex, the x-intercepts, and the y-intercept of this function f of x. So let's just start off with the very first one, uh, which is the vertex. Okay, this is in standard form. Standard form means we can say it's ax squared plus bx plus c. Right, which is the way our problem set up. When that's the case, we are going to uh, calculate the vertex using negative b over 2a. Okay. So negative b over 2a for our problem would be negative b would be 24 okay, over 2 times negative 3. So this looks like 24 divided by negative 6, <coughs> which is negative 4. Okay. So we're going to say, for my vertex, my point is negative 4 comma something, and the way, the way we figure out the output that goes with negative 4 is to plug it back in. So I'm going to say in this case, y is equal to uh, 3, negative 3 times negative 4 squared minus 24 times negative 4 plus 60. Okay, so to just save us some time, I'm going to use the calculator to plug this in. All right, so we're going to go to our calculator, and I'm going to type this in. It says negative 3 times negative 4. And be careful, watch how I'm typing this in. Uh, you need to type it in just like I am. There are going to be cases where if you type it in incorrectly, it's going to give you the wrong answer. So just be careful. All right, so I'm plugging in negative 4 plus 60. Okay, and it's telling me when I plug negative 4 into this function f of x, I get back a 108. All right, so it looks like my vertex is the point negative 4 comma 108. Okay, so that's step one. That's the first thing that they asked for, is this is my vertex. Okay. Okay. So we're not going to graph anything yet. We're not going to use the graph until we do all the rest of this work. Okay, it's asking for the x-intercepts. If you remember, the x-intercepts are when y is 0. Okay, so let's type uh, write x-intercepts. And that is some x comma 0. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave x alone, and I'm going to plug in for f of x. I'm going to put a 0. So this is going to turn into 0 equals uh, negative 3x squared minus 24x okay, plus 60. Okay. So this is a problem where you can solve this using the quadratic formula. This is very easy to solve with the quadratic formula. Uh, but you might look at this and say, hold on a second, 3, 24, and 60 all share uh, GCF, they share a 3. So I can divide everything by negative 3, and this is going to make it a much easier problem. Right? So if you don't notice that, it's entirely OK. You can just plug into the quadratic formula with negative 3, negative 24, and 60. You're just going to have to work with large numbers. I looked at this, and I said, wait a second. Divide it by negative 3, all of these, it's going to make it a lot easier. In this case, it looks like if I divide this by negative 3, I get x squared. If I divide negative 24 by negative 3, I get 8. Okay? And if I divide 60 by negative 3, I get a negative 20. Right? So this looks like a much easier problem to solve. In fact, we might be able to use factoring to solve this instead. And that's, in fact, what I'm going to use. Right? So when I'm looking at this complicated expression, if I can turn it into something simpler by dividing by a common factor, I'm going to use that to my advantage. So in this case, x squared plus 8x minus 10 factors into x plus 10 okay, and x minus 2. Okay? And so I can find two solutions. I'm going to get a negative 10, and I'm going to get a 2. So I actually have two x-intercepts. Let's write those down. I have negative 10, 0, and I have 2, 0. And if you want to use the quadratic formula and pause the video and do that, you're going to find that you get the exact same uh, two x values out of the quadratic formula using the original function. Okay? So those are my x-intercepts. Okay? My y-intercepts, right, let's try to split this up a little bit. Okay, so here's my vertex above the line, my x-intercepts are below the line. I only need a little tiny space here for the y-intercepts because y-intercepts okay, is some x value. Okay, I'm sorry, it is 0, comma, we know what x value is, right? So we're going to get rid of this 0. Okay, so we're going to say this is 0 comma some y value. Right? I'm going to plug in a 0 in the x spot. So I'm going to say in this case my y is equal to, I'm going to use the same function that you have on your paper, negative 3, but I know that x is 0. So every, everywhere I see an x, I'm going to write 0. Okay? 24 times 0 plus 60. And so if you notice what happens, this is that shortcut that I said the 60 at the end is really going to be the answer, because this turns into 0, 
minus, this turns into zero. So it's zero minus zero plus 60, well that's 60. So my y-intercept is zero comma 60. All right, so we've done the first step. It said, okay, to identify the vertex, the x-intercepts, and the y-intercept, okay, I'm gonna put a check mark there, okay? It's asking us to do some things, identifying the domain and identifying the range and identifying the point symmetric to the y-intercept, and those are all things that are easier to do if I can look at the graph. So what I'm gonna do is skip down to the last one that says graph the function and label the points. Okay, so if I graph the function and label the points, I'm going to be able to see the, uh, the point symmetric and I'm going to be able to see uh, what the domain and the range are. So let's get these th uh, three points that I have onto the graph. Okay? So I have a little bit of an issue. When I look at this vertex that I need to graph, it's all the way up at 108. Right? And I need to get 108 on this grid that only has 10 dashes. Okay, so I can go over to negative 4 easy enough. Right? X, uh, my x value is negative 4. These other ones, negative 10 and 2, those are also entirely reasonable to graph on here. But going up to 108 is going to be a bit of a challenge. So let's see how that works. So I go over to negative 4 and I'm here. And I need to get up to 108. And I only have 10 dashes to do it if you count. So I'm actually going to have to count by not 1s anymore. I have to figure out what to count by. If I count by uh, just tens, I'm at a hundred. So that's really not going to work. So maybe I want to count by 20. So let's see what each of these is worth, how high I get uh, if I count by 20. So I'm going to say 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 would be right here. Okay, 20, 40, 60, 80, this would be 200. So I need to make some indication on my graph about uh, what I'm what scale I'm using. And so all I did was I only marked a couple of them. 20, 40, 60, 81, 20, 40, 60, 82, right? So I, when I put my vertex down, when I'm going to go over to negative 4, okay, here's negative 4, and I'm going to go up to 100. And remember, this is 120, 40, 60, 82, right? So 120 is right here if 100 is my fifth dash, right? So 108 is going to be a little bit above 100, going to be about right there. Okay, so that's my graph of the vertex, negative 4, 108. Okay, negative 10, 0 is still right here, right, because 0, 20, right, so that's okay. And 2 is going to be right there. Okay, so I've graphed each of those points. It asked me to label them, so I'm going to make sure that on my graph I say that this is the point negative 4, 108, okay, and that this is the point 2, 0, and this is the point negative 10. Zero. All right. So you want to label each of those points uh, on the graph. Okay. So that's uh, the first part. So let's identify. Uh, I'm sorry. I have to put the y-intercept on there. The y-intercept is at the point zero comma sixty, which is nice. We counted by twenty, so this isn't that bad. So I'm going to go up to uh, twenty, forty, sixty. That's going to be right here. This is the point zero sixty. Okay. So now I can reflect it. It's pretty easy. If my vertex and my axis of symmetry is right here at negative four, I can count over and say one, two, three, four. Well, the, the point symmetric to the y-intercept should be the same distance on the other side. So I'm going to count over 1, 2, 3, 4. And that puts me right here. So I can answer their question. Identify the point symmetric to the y-intercept. That is at the point negative 8, 60. Right? So I can draw my, my parabola now. Here it is. Okay? I'm going to try to draw a nice parabola for us. Okay? Let me go back down. And here is the graph that they asked for. Okay? So I've done most of the work here. I calculated all of the points, that was bullet one. Bullet number three said identify the point symmetric to the y-intercept is negative eight comma 60, we just reflected. I graphed and labeled all the points. So the only thing I have left to do is to identify the domain and the range, and now that I have this nice graph, it's actually not that bad, right? I'm gonna say my domain, okay, as with all quadratics, is all real numbers, okay? My range, it looks like it goes up as high as 108, okay, but won't go any higher, so it's all of the y values that are less than or equal to 108, okay? So I'm only gonna do the first one. The second problem on here on the, the paper is entirely identical. I'm just giving you a second example to practice. So I'm not gonna do this one just for the sake of time. We've spent nine minutes just on the first one. So I'm gonna move on and look at some of the other problems. And if you're still unsure about problem number two, just ask me in class and we'll, we'll go over it then, okay? So here's problem number three. I'm asking you to find all solutions to the equation and in parentheses, I'm letting you know that by all solutions, I mean real number solutions and imaginary number solutions. And I'm asking you to leave your answer in simplest radical form, okay? So I'm basically just saying, solve this equation. Right, so we're going to take all of the stuff on the right, right hand side and move it over to the left. This is just a messy looking equation, so let's clean it up first. So when I subtract all this stuff on the right over, I'm going to say minus 2x squared minus 7x 
and I need to add 10 to make all that stuff go away. So let's bring that over. Now when I do it on this side, it's going to be minus 2x squared. Well, that's 3x squared. Okay, Minus 7x. Well, that's negative 10x. And then the plus 10 doesn't have anything to pair up with over here, so I'm just going to say plus 10. Okay. So this looks like a really good quadratic formula problem. I can't divide anything away and make this look any nicer. So I'm going to go right to my quadratic formula on this instead of trying to mess around with anything else. So this looks like 10 plus or minus the square root of, and again, I'm going to do b, b squared minus 4ac off to the side, so I don't have to show all the substituting. So b squared in this case is negative 10 squared, which is 100 minus 4 times 3 times 10. Okay. Well, 4 times 3 is 12. 12 times 10 is 120. So this says 100 minus 120. Well, 100 minus 120 is negative 20. So there's my b squared minus 4ac. All over 2a, well, that's 2 times 3, which is 6. So x is equal to this expression. So the only thing I need to do is to simplify my radical. This is my answer. right? So to negative 20, again, I'm going to come off to the side to do this work. I'm going to say the square root of negative 20 can be simplified. It can be simplified into the square root of 4, the square root of 5. Well, that's 20. And I need negative 20, so though there's the negative 1. All right, so square root of 4 is 2. Okay. Square root of negative 1 we defined already as i. And the square root of 5 I'm going to leave as the square root of 5. So the simplified version of this radical is 2i root 5. So let me rewrite my expression now. Okay. 10 plus or minus 2i root 5 all over 6. Okay. So I just replace the square root of negative 20 with 2i root 5. Okay. I have one more step to do, and that's because 10 sixths and 2 sixths can be simplified. So I'm going to divide everything by 2. And it's going to look like 5 plus or minus i root 5 all over 6. And this is my final answer. Okay, So this is two imaginary number solutions in simplest radical form. Problem letter B is the same thing. So once again, I'm going to, not going to do it. I'm going to skip it. This would be another great quadratic formula problem. I'll let you try that one out on your own. Okay, and we're going to move on to problem number four, and we're going to simplify some complex numbers. Right? So in this case, we need to go through and rationalize denominators. If you remember, one of the last things that we talked about when we talked about complex numbers was that i is not allowed to show up in the denominator. So again, I'm going to treat these separately, and then we'll deal with trying to add them together on uh, once we get the bottom of the fractions fixed. So let's just fix the bottoms. So I'm going to pull the 4 plus i. Oops, 4 plus i. 4 plus i over 2 minus 3i away from the problem and just deal with that. Okay? So this looks like if I want to rationalize the denominator here, I need to multiply the numerator and the denominator by the complex conjugate, which means this expression, but I'm going to switch the operation inside. I mean, it's going to be 2 plus 3i now. Okay? And the reason that I'm doing that is we talked about how when you multiply an, a, a complex number by its conjugate, you're going to get a real number all the time. And that's what we're trying to get on the bottom of this fraction. Right? So in this case, when I multiply out, and I'm going to let you do the multiplying out, uh, two, I, or 2 minus 3i and 2 plus 3i, I get 4. And if you double distribute everything, you're going to end up getting 4 plus 9. Okay? And again, I'll let you do the, the distributing and the simplifying to make sure that that works out. Okay. On the top, I need to FOIL this out. This is two complex numbers that I'm multiplying. So here's what this looks like. 8. Okay. When I multiply 4 times 3, I get 12i. Okay. And this is the same process we do on the bottom. Okay. 12i, 2i, okay. and 3i squared. Okay. So let me extend out my fraction bar a little bit. So when I simplify this, it's going to look like, well, 8. And this, remember, negative, or i squared is really negative 1. So let me do a little fix here. 3 times negative 1 is what this really means. So this is really negative 3. So this says 8 minus 3. Well, 8 minus 3 is 5. Okay? So again, if you're unsure about that, i squared is negative 1. So I just replaced i squared with negative 1. And when I multiply these together, this whole expression just becomes minus 3. Okay? And then 12i and 2i is 14i okay? all over 13. Okay? So I'm going to replace, this is my simplified, rationalized denominator problem. I'm going to replace this expression that I started with, with 5 plus 14i all over 13. Okay? I need to do the exact same thing with the second problem, so let's start over again. 
Okay. So in the second problem, I'm going to pull that away and say 6 minus 5i over 4i. This one's a little bit easier. Because it's only got a monomial on the bottom, right? the one on the left had this binomial expression, and that's why we had to do all this complex conjugate stuff. Right? When we're talking about a monomial like 4i, the only thing you need to do is to multiply it by i on the top and the bottom. Okay, so watch what happens. When I multiply the top by i, I get 6i minus 5i squared, and the bottom I get 4i squared. And the reason we like this is because i squared is uh, negative 1. Okay, let me get rid of my calculator that's been hiding some of the work for you. Okay, so i squared is equal to negative 1. Okay, so I'm going to replace those. I'm going to say this is really 4 times negative 1. And on top, I have 6i minus 5 times negative 1. Okay? So let's simplify this. The bottom becomes negative 4. Okay? The top, remember, we like our answers to be in a plus bi form, which means always put the i second. Okay? So I'm going to put 6i okay, right here. So it's positive 6i. And this is going to become negative 5 times negative 1 is 5. Okay? So I can leave my answer like that. Right? I'm going to bring this over now, and I'm going to say this is now 5 plus 6i all over negative 4. Okay? So now I have rationalized denominators. Now I can even try to add these together. There's a plus sign in between those, by the way. Okay? So I can add these together now. So whenever we add fractions, which these are fractions, they are a number divided by a number, and that's what a fraction is, we add fractions by finding common denominators. So my job is to figure out the common denominator of 13 and 4. Okay, so we're going to do that. So I'm going to say the the common factor, I'm sorry, the common denominator of 13 and 4 is 52. Okay, and you can go through and check. 13 times 4 is 52, so that's a really easy one to do. So I'm going to say uh, 5 plus 4i. Right, this i multiplied by 4. So I need to multiply this by 4 as well. So I can't keep 5 plus 4, 14i. Right, so I'm going to get rid of this. And I need to multiply the, I multiplied the bottom by 4 to get a 52. So I need to multiply the top by 4 as well. So it's actually going to become 20 plus 60, 56i. Okay, so let me fix that. Okay, plus 56i. Okay, plus, and now I need to do the same thing with the bottom. Here's the one issue though. I have a negative 4 on the bottom, so I need, I'm going to make a little adjustment. Instead of the negative being on the bottom, I could also say, Let's get rid of that. And let me give the negative to the top of the fraction. So if I give a negative here, it's going to look like, instead of looking like 5 plus 6i, okay, I, I'm giving the negative to all of those pieces. So I'm going to get rid of this. And I'm going to say, instead, it's going to look like negative 5 minus 6i. Right? So I just move the negative off the bottom, because I want to try to get matching 52s. And if I multiplied this by 13, now I will, and if I had a negative 4, I wouldn't get a 52, I'd get a negative 52. So I need to multiply this one top and bottom by 13. So let's see what happens. Well, 4 times 13, there's the 52. Good, that works. Okay, 13 times negative 5, that is negative 65. Okay, 13 times 6 is going to be uh, 48. No, I'm sorry, 13 times 6 is going to be 78. Okay, so this is going to be minus 78i. So, now I'm ready to add, right? Our first problem was that we had to fix the i's, so I kind of did that for each of the problems. I did that for the second problem. And then it was they didn't have common denominators, so we multiplied this one by 4 to make it a 52. We multiplied the second one by 13, that makes it a 52. Now we're ready to add, now that we have common denominators. Both of these are going to have a 52. Okay, I'm going to do the real number plus the real number. That's going to be 20 plus negative 65, which is negative 45. Okay, and it's going to be 56i minus 78i, right, which is going to be 16i. Okay, negative 16i. Negative 16i. Okay, so if I take a look at this, this is my final answer. This is a complex number. Okay, except one little thing we have to fix. It says leave your answer in a plus bi form, and this is not a plus bi form. So I need to just give the 52 separately to the 45 and the 16. So watch what I do. Okay, I'm going to say negative 45 over 52 minus, because there was a minus sign in between them, okay, 16 over 52i. 
And if you notice, if I asked you what A is, the answer is, now A is 40, negative 45 over 52, plus B is the negative 16 over 52. So in order to get it in this form, A plus BI, and talk about the real number part and the imaginary number part, uh, I needed to split the 52 and give each of the numbers their own 52 so that I could talk about A and B separately. Okay, so again, if you take a look at part B, very similar, except you only actually have to rationalize one of the denominators before you add and find common denominators. So again, I'm going to leave 4B for you to try on your own, and you can ask me if you need to see a key on how to do that. Okay, problem number five. Okay, they want to know what values will make j of x and k of x, uh, what values of x will make j of x equal to k of x. So my job is really to set j of x equal to k of x. So I'm going to just set these two expressions equal. Okay, and this is really just a system of equations where one is quadratic and one is linear. So I'm just going to, now that they're set equal, solve this equation. So I'm going to subtract all this stuff on the right over to the left, and it's going to look like x squared minus 10x. And when I do 11, add 11 over, I get 21. Okay, this is a nice factorable expression. So I'm going to say this turns into x minus 7 and x minus 3. Okay, and if I solve each of these, I get x is equal to 7 and x is equal to 3. They're asking what values of x will make them equal. I'm saying x is 7 is a solution and x is 3 is a solution. So that's a nice quick problem. You just have to know to set them equal to each other and then know how to solve the quadratic. Let's move on. Problem number six, same thing. Again, I'm not going to do all the repeats for you. So if you want to take a look at problem number six and try to solve that, there will be a key posted for you. Problem number seven, determine the average rate of change for each of the following functions over negative two to positive three. So what they're asking us to do, if you remember the average rate of change formula, okay, the fancy version was f of x minus f of a over x minus a, which was really similar to our slope formula, which was just subtract the y's over subtract the x's. So whichever version you like, okay, you can use. But we're really trying to subtract the outputs on the top and the inputs on the bottom. So if when I'm given an equation, I know my x values, they're given to me. They're saying start at negative 2, end at positive 3. So I'm going to write that as my x values. So I'm going to say on the bottom, I'm going to have negative 2 minus 3. Okay, but for each of these, if I'm talking about a point x2, uh, y2, what I really know is that the x2 is a 3, and I don't know what's the y that goes with that. I have to go back to my equation and plug in to find that. So I'm going to do f of negative 2 to find out what comes out. Okay, and it, that looks like negative 2 squared minus 7 times negative 2 plus 4. Okay, well, this is 4 plus 14 plus 4. Okay? So that looks like f of negative 2 is equal to 4 plus 4 is 18. 18 plus another 4 would be 22. Right? So I know that when I plugged in negative 2, my output was 22. Okay? I can do the same thing with 3. Okay, I'm so I'm going to say different color. f of 3 is equal to 3 squared minus 7 times 3 plus 4. Okay, well this says 9 minus 21 plus 4. 9 minus 21 is negative 12. Negative 12 plus 4 is equal to negative 8. So I'm going to say f of 3, when I plug in 3, I get back negative 8. So I'm going to say this is minus because of the formula. And when I plugged in 3, I got back negative 8. Okay, so now I can calculate the average rate of change. This looks like 22 minus negative 8, which is the same thing as 22 plus 8. So that's 30. Be careful with that. Negative 2 minus 3 is negative 5. So I can simplify this and say the final answer, the average rate of change over this interval, is negative 6. All right, let's keep going. Okay, same thing with the second problem. Let's just do the quick version of this. Right, so my bottom of my fraction is the same. It's going to be negative 2 minus 3. Okay, when I plug in a negative 2 here, I'm going to get negative 20 minus 7, which is negative 27. Okay, and when I plug in a 3, I'm going to get 10 times 3 is 30 minus 7, which is 23. That was positive, so I don't have that extra negative symbol. All right, so this is a negative 5 on the bottom. And it looks like a negative 50 on the top. So this turns out to be positive 10. Okay? 
So same idea I plugged in to get the y values, right? So here's your next one. I'm saying determine the average rate of change. So nothing's going to uh, change for us. We're going to still subtract the x values on the interval, negative 2 minus 3. To get the y values this time, I don't have an equation to plug into. Instead, what I have is a table of values. I know when they told us, they've done all the work for us. I know when I plug in negative 2, I get a negative 4 back. So I'm going to plug write that down. I know when I've got a 3 plugged in, a 5 came out. So I'm going to say minus 5. So this looks like negative 9 over negative 5. And I can simplify that. Negative divided by negative does simplify. So I'm going to say 9 over 5. That is my average rate of change for this function. All right, letter D. Same thing, they're still saying, let's find the average rate of change. So I'm going to do negative 2 minus 3. Those are the x values, and they go on the bottom of the fraction. Right? But to get my y values now that go with negative 2, I actually have to go over to the equation, and there's a negative 2, 5 on the graph. In this case, they were labeled. You might actually have to go uh, figure out what the points are yourself. So when I plugged in negative 2, I got a 5 back. Okay? When I plug in a 3, it looks like I get a 0 back. The 3, 0 is a point. So this looks like 5 over negative 5, which is negative 1. So I would say the average rate of change for uh, 7D is negative 1. Right? Letter E is asking, which of the four functions above has the highest average rate of change? So let's go collect them real quick. Right? If we go back to letter A, the average rate of change was 6. So let's write that one down. So we're saying f of x was 6. Okay? And g of x, I'm sorry, it was negative 6. G of, uh, g of x was 10, okay? So this was negative 6, okay? G of x was 10, and that was positive, right? If I go back to h of x, okay? h of x was 9 fifths, okay? So let's get that one on here. h of x was positive 9 fifths because we had some canceling of negatives happening. And j of x, the last one we did, came out to be negative 1. So j of x is negative 1. So if I'm comparing these, this is where you have to be careful. Okay? Remember, the sign, the negatives that are showing up in f of x and j of x, we're going to disregard those because they're not really telling us about the number. They're telling us about the direction of the graph. We're saying, on average, f of x and j of x are traveling downhill over that interval. So we're not going to include that when we're saying which one's the highest. Right? So in this case, I'm really comparing 6, 10, 9 fifths, and 1, and g of x in this case is going to be my winner. I'm going to say g of x has a, the highest number when we're not including the sign. So we're really talking about the absolute value when we're, when we're discussing this. So the answer to letter E, which of the four functions has the highest average rate of change? The answer is g of x does because 10 is the largest of those four values. All right, problem number eight. They're asking me to do a couple of things. Given this transformation, they're giving me the picture of the parent function, right? This is at y equals x squared, right? They call that f of x up here. And then they're saying, I have this other function, g of x, okay? And they're not telling me what they did. They're kind of saying, we did some transformations with a and with c and with d, and they're not going to tell us what they are. And we have to figure that out for ourselves. So the first thing is, let's determine the equation of g of x. Um, so if I'm looking at this, remember c and d represented the transformations left and right and up and down. Okay? And then a's job was to do reflecting, which I ha actually had happen here. This is upside down. And it also made the graph get skinnier okay? or maybe wider. Okay? So I have to figure out. If that happened, and kind of looking at it, it does look skinnier than my original graph, but we're going to figure that out. We're going to actually calculate. Okay, so to, to calculate the equation, to figure out what the equation, we need the vertex, because remember, vertex goes uh, here. If I, uh, I'm basically saying 0, 0 was the original function. It looks like I went left by 5 units, because this is negative 5, okay? And I went up by, it looks like, 3 units. This point right here, my new vertex for the transformed equation, is negative 5, 3. Okay? So it looks like I went, if I'm describing this, left by 3, and I went, I'm sorry, left by 5, and up by 3. So left by 5, and up by 3. Okay? So if I tried to turn that into the equation, what I'm going to say is this was x, 
Well, left 3 is negative 3, so minus negative 3 squared, because this is a quadratic. So I got rid of the f, because I know that this is a squared function. Okay, So this is uh, plus 3. Oh, let me fix that. Okay, x, I moved to the left by 5. Okay, So I went x minus negative 5 plus 3. I don't know what a is, because I don't know how skinny or wide it got, right? and I'm going to call it g of x. Okay. <clears throat> So I can at least fill in some information. I know that the vertex is at uh, negative three or negative five three. So I'm going to just clean this up. This is x plus five squared plus three. Okay. There's an a. Okay. And I'm going to turn g of x into y because what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this g of x function and we're going to find a point. Here's a nice point: the x-intercept negative four comma zero. I'm going to plug that in. Okay. Watch what happens. I'm going to say negative four zero is an x and a y. Okay? So I'm going to plug in for x a negative 4. Okay? And for y, on the other side, I'm going to plug in the y part of that point, which is 0. And the reason I did that is because now the only variable left in my original equation is a, which means I can solve for it. I can figure out what a is. Okay, so this says negative 4 plus 5. Well, that's 1 squared. So this says 1 squared, which is 1, 1 times a. Well, I'll just call that 1a so you can see the 1. Okay, so I'm going to keep solving. Okay, I want to get a alone, so let's subtract the 3 over. So it's negative 3 equals, well, 1a is just a. Oh, there it is. a is negative 3. So I can say that my new equation, the equation of this parabola is negative 3 x plus 5 squared plus 3. This is the final equation for the transformed parabola. And we, had to, we actually used the transformations to help us out with that. Without being able to recognize that my vertex moved from 0, 0 to negative 5, 3, I wouldn't have been able to fill in some of this C and D information. So that idea of transformations was really important for us to be able to figure out what A was using a calculation. Right? So the second part's just kind of a little extra. Um, it's asking you what 2A plus 3C minus D is. Well, I know what all those values are now. My A value we just calculated. That's negative 3. So I'm going to plug that in. Okay. C, be very careful. C is negative 5 because I moved to the left by 5. So this is 3 times negative 5 minus, well, my d value is a 3. Okay, So 2a plus 3c minus d, I just plugged in a, c, and d. Well, this is negative 6 minus 15 minus 3. Well, that's negative 21 minus 3. Uh, the final answer for this is negative 24. So the answer to the second question, it was just after you've done all the work in part a to figure out the equation, what a, c, and d are, just go and plug them into part b, and that's the answer that they're looking for. All right, we're almost done. We got two more problems. Uh, problem number nine has a couple of parts to it. It's saying uh, that I'm throwing a baseball. I'm on top of the school building. They're giving me a velocity, and they're giving me how high up I am. So when I'm on top of the school building, how high was the ball when I let go? And in this case, 84 feet up. They're giving me the vertical motion formula. So this is what I'm going to plug into. Okay. So this is slightly different than what we saw in class. Um, these little zeros. Okay, at the beginning are just uh, a notation that stands for initial velocity. So there's initial velocity. This is used more in like a physics uh, type class where you'll see that the initial velocity that when we started will have these little zeros at the end of it. But it's still v, right? So I'm going to go up to my velocity and that's 38. So I'm going to say uh, my formula is h of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 38v, because that was my velocity, and it looks like I'm 84 feet high, so my initial height is 84. So this is the uh, the velocity formula that I'm going to use, the vertical motion equation that I'm going to use for this situation. So the first question for letter A says, when does the ball hit the ground? Well, if you remember from other problems, the ground is zero, so I'm trying to figure out when. When represents time, so I'm not going to plug in for time. I'm trying to find that. I'm going to plug in for h of t. So this is going to be negative 16 t squared plus 38. Oops, sorry, this is a t, not a v. Okay, 38 t plus 84. Okay, I plugged in for v, so t is still left over. Okay, so I'm going to solve this equation. This is a quadratic formula problem, right? So I'm going to say this is negative 38 plus or minus, and let's go to the calculator to get b squared minus 4ac. Okay, so I'm going to say 
on my calculator. Okay, let's do negative 38 squared. I'm sorry, 38 squared. B squared minus 40C would be 38 squared. Okay, minus 4 times negative 16 okay, times 84. That's B squared minus 4AC. Okay, which comes out to be 6,820. That's my discriminant all over. 2A would be 2 times negative 16, which is negative 32. So my T value, my time, my when, is going to be the, the answers to this quadratic formula. So we're going to actually get two values again, and we'll, we'll let the calculator do that for us. All right, so I'm going to um, go back to my calculator, and I'm going to say, uh, let's do negative 38 okay, plus the square root of 6820. Hit enter to get my answer for the numerator, and then divide by okay, the other divide by. Okay. So I'm going to take my answer and divide by negative 32. And I need to get rid of this little exponent. Okay. Let's delete that. Okay. So I'm taking my answer from the numerator, and I'm dividing by negative 32, and it's saying negative 1.4 seconds. Okay. Which this is the bad one, right? We're talking about time, negative time, not useful. So let's go check our other one. If I do the same thing and say negative 38 minus 6820, the square root of 6820, okay, get my answer, divide it by negative 32, here's the answer, 3.77 seconds. Okay. So the answer to part A when does the ball hit the ground? It hits the ground 1.77 seconds after we let it go. Okay, so that's part A. Part B is asking when or what is the maximum height of the ball? So they're saying what is h of t? Right, so let's figure that one out. Okay, so the maximum, when I see the word maximum, I'm thinking, okay, here's the way what it's going to look like. Hey, okay, I'm throwing the ball like I'm up on some building. Hey, okay, I'm up here and I'm throwing the ball. And it's going like this, and eventually it's going to come down and hit the ground. So what I really care about for this part B is when is the ball here? That's the maximum height, right, before it turns and starts heading back down. Another word for that point is the vertex. So I'm really going to calculate the vertex. So I'm going to say t equals negative b over 2a. Well, for us, negative b would be negative 38 over 2 times negative 16. Okay, so if I go to my calculator again, we'll let it do that work for us. Okay, it's going to be negative 38, okay, and the bottom of the fraction is going to turn into negative 32. So that looks like 1.1875, which I am not going to round. I'm going to leave it just like that. Okay, so this is what this represents. This is t, 1.1875 uh, seconds. So here's what this means. How, if I asked you how long does it take me to get to the maximum height, it took me 1.1875 seconds to get from my hand to the vertex at the top right here. But that's not what the question asked. The question asked, what is the height itself? So that we would get that by taking the amount of time that we just calculated, 1.1875 seconds, plugging it back into the equation. So if I want to know what h is, okay, I'm going to say, let's do uh, negative 16 times 1.1875 squared. Right, that's the t. That's time. 38 also times that same 1.1875 okay, plus 84. Okay, so again, this is a calculator thing. We'll let it do the work here. So this is negative 16. Okay. Negative 16 times. 1.1875 squared, 1.1875 squared, plus 38 times 1.1875, okay, plus 84. And so it's going to tell us that after 1.1875 seconds, the ball was at 106 0.5625 feet, which I'm going to round that. I'm just going to say 106.6 uh, feet. Okay, so it the ball started off at 84 feet high. It got up to 106.6 feet, and then it started falling again. That's the answer to the second one. Okay, 
The third question saying, on what interval is the baseball increasing and decreasing? So let's take a look at our picture again. Okay, we don't need the calculator anymore, so I'm going to make that go away. Okay, and we're going to take a look at this picture. So here's what this is telling us. The, the ball was going up, right? It was increasing from when it left my hand until it got to the vertex. Because when it got to the vertex, okay, it started falling again, right? So here's my uphill. Here's my downhill. Okay, so it looks like for part C, let me get my pen again, part C, I'll squeeze right in here, okay, letter C, it's going uphill from T is 0 seconds to T is, well, we got to figure out what was the T value right here. Well, it's the T value at the vertex at that point. We've already done that. That's 1.1875 seconds. So from when it left my hand at 0 seconds until 1.1875 seconds, okay, it was increasing. It was going uphill. Okay, And then from t is equal to 1.1875 seconds to it hit the ground. Well, when did it hit the ground? It hit the ground at 3.77 seconds. We calculated that in part A, right? to 3.77 seconds, it was decreasing, and then it stopped decreasing because it hit the ground. Right? So I'm actually using what I did in part A and what I did in part B to fill in the blanks here. I'm saying from, from 0 seconds until it got to the vertex, that's the increase, and then from the vertex back down to the ground, that was the decrease. So we're going to use that as our answer for letter C. All right, last problem. The graph on the left represents f of x, and the table on the right represents g of x. I'm just going to do a quick label. Okay? I like labeling. This is f of x and g of x. And they're saying, if f of negative 3 is equal to m, well, let's stop there. Let's not even read the rest of the problem. If f of negative 3 is m, it says find m. OK, so this is saying, when I go to the f of x function, which is the graph, and I say my input, my x part, is negative 3, what's the output? Well, that looks like negative 5. So I'm going to actually say right here, m is equal to negative 5. Okay? That's the first part of their problem. It says, find m. Done. Okay? It says, then give the value of g of m plus 5. So that means g of, well, I know what m is. I figured it out right here. This is negative 5 plus 5. Well, that's really just g of 0. Well, what's g of 0? Let's go to the g function. That's this one. When uh, x is 0, y is 1. So I'm going to say g of m plus 5 is 1. Okay? And that's the end of the video. If you have any major questions or concerns, if you need anything else on here clarified, please make sure you ask. This is what will be on your unit test.